I'm going to blow your mind. Yes. I've got something so important, so astounding to tell you. I just can't hold back a moment longer. I have to break this news. The person speaking to you now is no one less than the world's greatest storyteller. No, no, no. I must try to restrain my natural inclination towards self-effacing modesty. For the real truth is that Ramsey Jukes is not merely the world's greatest storyteller. He is the greatest storyteller that ever in the entire history of the world, since time immemorial, period. Told you this was big. I have also been gifted with the most exceptional psychic powers. Even though I don't know you, the individual now watching this, I may never have even heard of you. I refer to the individual human being now watching this. But I'm gifted with an uncanny perception that you might not believe me. I sense that you may be wondering why, if this should be the case, you've not heard my name being lauded in the media, showered with literary awards, subject to endless rave reviews. What? Don't tell me you pay any heed to that snivelling mob of lickspittle sycophants. Those empty-headed gas bags paid to put their worthless names to clichéd and seldom true statements like Astounding, Dazzling, The Most Important Book of the Year, or A Triumph. Statements to be highlighted all over the garish covers of mindless, derivative, dreary, so-called bestsellers. No. If you want to discover the real truth, you do not waste time with hack reviewers being paid by word count. Instead, you interview people with insider perception. You go direct to those in the know. Naturally, as the epitome of the sort of alert, enlightened, and intellectually curious individuals who would elect to read the works of Ramsey Jukes, you want some examples. So let me begin with the big one oft described as the greatest story ever told. Yes, I'm busy rewriting the Holy Bible, as it could have been if only God had asked me. It contains a book about a character called Job. Not connected with Apple. That comes earlier in Genesis. Alfred Lord Tennyson called the book of Job the greatest poem of ancient and modern times. It tells a sad story of Job, a wealthy landowner and family man being steadily stripped of everything in his life, leaving him destitute, even though he is a goodly, God-fearing man, guilty of no sin. My new version begins in a similar vein. And Job does receive the message his livestock have all died. But instead of receiving more of those awful messages, in my version, the next message comes direct from God. He apologizes to Job, admitting it was simply a trial of his fortitude. God then announces that, in compensation, Job's animals are now being restored from the dead. Neat, eh? I cannot tell you what Job said when he read my version, because he was rendered speechless. He simply flung his arms around me and sobbed his gratitude. His family described my rewrite as the best thing that has ever happened. In 
contrast, I'll illustrate the scope of my talent with another very different example. The novel Casino Royale by Ian Fleming has James Bond as a British secret agent playing a high-stakes poker game with an evil underworld banker called Le Chiffre. This is just the start of a hellish game of cat and mouse that begins with Bond losing all his money. In my improved version, however, I've added a clever twist. Instead of losing, Bond wins everything from Le Chiffre, who is aghast. He turns to Bond and says, My God, Bond. Oh, I can't read it without these spectacles. If the British Secret Service employs men of your calibre, then the criminal underworld hasn't got a choping L. I am going straight. Bond then has the good fortune to break the bank, casino bank. He chucks in his job and retires to life on a luxury yacht with Vesper, his new woman friend. The reaction? Ramsey, old boy, you're a real brick, <laughs> says James. You know, that sick bastard Fleming was having me stripped naked, tied into a seatless chair while my balls were bashed with a carpet beater. Your version is sheer genius. I have so many more examples. Tolstoy is nothing but praise for the, my updates of his novels, notably a slim volume called And Peace. Soon anyone who is anyone will be quoting my iconic opening sentence to the new tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the epoch of belief. It was the season of light. It was the spring of hope. My triumphs are simply boundless. And yet, tuning in to my uncanny perception of you, the listener's thoughts, I sense a distinct impression that you might still remain not 100% convinced. So look into my eyes. Yes. I'm going to have to try a different approach. Hmm. The threefold way. The trinity of the good, the beautiful and the true dates back to the Bhagavad Gita and the teachings of Plato, if not earlier. For Aristotle, they were the transcendent properties of existence, both as three categories of knowledge and as their ideal forms. Later, we no longer see them as perfect platonic forms, but rather as three fundamental perspectives on reality. As with the later Christian trinity, these three are not competing rivals. They are distinct and yet dynamically interlinked. True beauty is truth. Truth is beautiful. The good is beautiful and true. And everything beautiful is good. Ideas that found a new flowering in the Renaissance, at which time the three began to be fragmented by division. The Protestant Revolution turned against the popular cod polytheism of the Catholic Church, where the one God is mediated by a host of saints, angels, colourful relics and statues. Protestantism was fiercely monotheistic and Puritan in its attack on all hocus-pocus, as it mockingly labelled the hoc est corpus meum of Catholic transubstantiation. 
Magic in any form was outlawed by the Puritans. Beauty, a mere worldly quality, was demoted, leaving only goodness and truth. Out of this ascetic rationalization grew modern science, where even goodness has been demoted. It leaves truth standing alone as our culture's sole measure of value. Beauty and goodness are still admitted as mere sops for the lower emotional parts of our highly developed brains. We are not encouraged to develop our sensitivity such trivia. For art provides it more, little more than a play to end to, qu to, to quarantine the arty farty. And those superstitious inadequates who fail to fully embrace the truth of science, well, they have religion. Existence is reduced to a single dimension spanning truth and delusion. More recently, all human experience has become digitized into just two binary states. True or false. Not only has this impoverished the richness of human experience, it is sullied truth itself. Truth and reality are now dirty words. When did you last hear phrases such as let's face the facts or the truth or reality is that? Introducing a statement of concept that is actually beautiful or good. We do not hear, let's face the fact that existence is pure joy, that life is beautiful, or the plain truth is that the universe is a manifestation of God's infinite wisdom and love. Instead, we are told to face the truth that entropy increases. The universe does not care. Shit happens. Life is tough. Survival of the fittest. Or simply, life is a terminal, sexually transmitted condition. Truth and reality are now nothing more than labels on a crock of shit. So why are some people so amazed by others' acceptance and welcome of a post-truth culture? The majority do lack deep perception and awareness of beauty and goodness. When some politician promises to make our nation great, the establishment rails against the statement's want of truth. Rather than recognise as a piece of froth, lightly flavoured with some artificial essence of beauty and goodness in place of real nourishment. As junk food, it'll leave the public even hungrier for something that is no longer allowed recognition. He or she will win the vote, and the opposition's only recourse is to scream, But that's not true! Rather than recognise a natural human hunger for other criteria of value. I'm not crying out for the truth to be abandoned, but for a recognition of the equal value and interdependence of the beautiful and the good. Instead of assessing the words of leaders, media and preachers purely on grounds of truth, we need to develop our awareness and sensitivity to beauty and goodness. Then we can better examine those fake essences that politicians and media currently add to deceive us and dig down in search of real beauty, goodness and truth. It's also time that leaders, media and preachers themselves acknowledge what they are doing and learn to seek out, foster and deliver a greater measure of these three qualities to an increasingly hungry and critical public. Why now? These issues became vivid in my mind when I was preparing the transcript of my Abramelin diary for publication by Ian Books. It was a modest project, for the manuscript had already been transcribed and edited. And yet, that modest task spun out for over a year. 
in which time I experienced my first sign of cancer. I underwent three operations. My office suffered a fire, rising damp, and an actual flood. Not bad going in a year when Cape Town was suffering its worst ever drought. In particular, my office was burgled for the first time. And the only things stolen were the computer system hosting my written work, plus, unfortunately, the backup drive. As a belt and braces man, however, I also had an off-site wireless backup. So I was not desperate, until I discovered that its sparse bundle was corrupt. I then spent a fortune on recovery software and weeks of disk recovery services, but all was lost. Meanwhile, ripples of torment seemed to be spreading out across my friends, family and neighbours. Hearing about this, some people's reaction was to say that I should, abomish the, I should abandon the publication of this accursed magical diary. Others asked why I had not got the message that the great magician Ramsey Duke should banish and blast those Abramelian demons out of his life to restore normality. But I didn't either. I persisted. Sure, things were getting pretty bad, but hasn't the whole world been getting pretty bad in recent years? I could not believe that a magical diary describing a not very successful operation by a minor occult practitioner could really present such a threat to, go to global stability. During one aeroplane flight, it occurred to me that if it was indeed important for the universe to stall the publication of this book, then why not simply kill me and have done with it? In the light of such fresh perspectives, my whole period of torment began to appear somewhat playful, tricksterish. I was being written into a great narrative. Not simply editing a diary. I was suffering the anticipated torments of all who seriously attempt the notoriously dangerous Abramelin operation. I was living the myth that had defeated even the great Alastair Crowley himself. I was experiencing something cosmic, archetypal. And yet there were people who wanted me to stop right there. It was the reverse of the response I had from Job. It went beyond stoicism. I was raising my arms to heaven and screaming, Bring it on! But not much more happened. No two ways about it. The Puritan doctrine infusing our scientific culture has demoted the good and the beautiful and recognizes just one principle, the true. This is the epitome of the monotheistic principle that admits only one single deity or absolute. It is why scientists seek only the theory of everything and the truth. And it goes against humanity's more natural embrace of multiplicity. The theory of natural selection is now presented as a mono-justification for all life on Earth. Darwin himself, in his later book, The Descent of Man, proposes the second complementary theory of sexual selection. The peacock's tail defies the survival of the fittest, but it evolves that way because peahens find it attractive, i.e. because it is beautiful. But not even Darwin is permitted to admit beauty. The neo-Darwinians justify this aberration by suggesting that Quote, the reason it attracts the peahen is because its very unfitness must imply exceptional genes in the surviving peacock. At a stroke, Darwin's genius has been reduced to a Barnum statement as follows. Should any creature diverge from normality towards greater fitness, then natural selection will lead the gene pool in that direction. On the other hand, should any creature diverge towards lesser fitness, then natural selection, via sexual preference, will lead the gene pool in that opposite direction. A theory of stasis, not evolution. 
The Taoists, at least, recognized two principles, yin and yang. And however hard Christianity espoused a pure monotheism, its followers keep reverting to the Manichaean concept of God versus the demiurge or devil. As a variation on the trinity of goodness, beauty and truth, my book, The Good, the Bad, the Funny, extends the Manichaean duality by welcoming the trickster as a third player, as in some African religions. To issue forth. Then, in my years of magical thinking, I propose a four-dimensional playing field for human experience. I explore the possibility of a fourth transcendental property, but struggle to label it. Instead, I suggest that the three cultures of art, religion and science should be completed by a fourth culture of magic. Then my question becomes, where does magic lead us, if not towards just goodness, beauty and or truth? The best I could come up with something on the lines of fulfilment, growth, or ultimately wholeness to complete my compass of four directions. There is indeed something less universal and more individual and personal about magic compared to the other three cultures. Both Alistair Crowley and Diane Fortune describe it in terms of changes in accordance with will, i.e. a move towards a personally desired state that is certainly embraces elements of beauty, goodness and truth, and yet is never completely defined by them. The trouble is that our society is even more naive about magic than it is about art and religion. In my dazzling career as the world's greatest storyteller, I offer James Bond what he most desires. That is a low form of magic. But it is what the majority understands by the word. I did not offer James a significant growth experience. Ian Fleming would have James suffer his balls being bashed by a carpet beater, an event designed to increase the book's aesthetic value to the reader by upping the ante of our hero's ultimate triumph. Whether James appreciated that gift while enduring the pain is not spelled out. In the greater context of this ultimate victory, the circumstance might at least be acknowledged as an opportunity for growth a higher magic than that offered by the world's greatest storyteller. Not that Casino Roll is presented as some New Age manual, discover your inner hero with a carpet beater, but simply that a greater openness to beauty and goodness might add further dimensions to the readers as well as James's experience. All my rewritten characters can see some good in my transformations, and they bless me for it, Job and James. and But it is not the good. For why should James Bond or Job be given such an unfair advantage? It is not. They also see great beauty in my versions of their stories. But it is not the beautiful. Because you, the reader, can tell that from a literary and dramatic viewpoint, my stories are utter crap. Least of all are my stories true, or even a match for the second right criterion of true to life. And yet, my versions offer a relief, a liberation, and something of enormous value to the characters involved. For I enter their worlds as a magician, with the power to realize their greatest dreams. I replace the limitations and frustrations of their literary existence with a playing field levelled for ultimate fulfilment. Thus, to any individual, the direction that I ascribe to magic towards personal fulfilment or wholeness is surely the most desirable of all. And yet our culture denies magic, even the modest roles allowed to art and religion. Magic is so not the truth that it is non-existence encompassing. In my years of magical thinking, I extol the value of directional over categorical perception. Where well-defined categories so beloved by reason reduce experience into exclusive fragments, directions prove 
inclusive. In my furthest venture to the north, when I visited Carl Abrahamson in Stockholm, I found myself surrounded by every but as much east, west, north and even south as in my home in Cape Town. That is how I see my four dimensions of existence as a compass of four directions, art, religion, science and magic. Practice science as I feel it should be practiced, and seldom is outside Waldorf education. And you should discover not just truth, but also some measure of goodness, beauty, and even personal fulfillment. Practice art, as I feel it should be practiced, and you should discover not just beauty, but also fulfillment, goodness, and truth. Practice religion right here and expect to find some measure of goodness, beauty, fulfillment, and truth. I have less to go on in the case of magic, apart from my own experience. The, there I have had a taste of fulfillment, definitely beauty and goodness, as well as, hold on to your seats, truth, profound truth. Let us therefore dance from here into a space of four dimensions. Are you sitting comfortably? Then listen to the words of the world's greatest storyteller.